for this particular virus, it's people with cardiovascular disease, diabetes, high blood pressure, more so risks than lung disease. So this is unusual. Hi everyone, and welcome to the Evolving Ageless podcast. This is the Enlightened Woman's Antidote to Aging. I'm your host, Michelle Dreilich, and I am on a mission to change the way we age. And so every week I'm joined by the latest and greatest researchers, clinicians, specialists that share all of their experience and expertise with us. And so today I am super excited, not only because of the topic, which is coronavirus and what we need to know, but because it's Dr. Ellie Campbell. And Dr. Campbell, I have known about for about five years. She doesn't even know this about, <laughs> I've been a super fan uh, on the periphery. And last fall, I had the pleasure of meeting her at a clinical conference. And I can tell you, she is as brilliant uh, of a clinician as she is a caring uh a caring individual about her patients, about her community. And the other thing is that she cares most about the, the practice of medicine, meaning how her colleagues are doing, how they take care of themselves, um, yeah. and just making sure physicians have a passion and a love for medicine, which is why they got into it to begin with. So yeah. I'm so excited to have you here. Thank you, Michelle. It's great to be here. <laughs> So Dr. Campbell's practice, she's been practicing for over 25 years, and she is in the northern suburbs of Atlanta. So anything you learn here today, she's easy to find. Um, but so let's turn our sights on the topic today, which is coronavirus. I know it's hot. It's all over the place. I was at a conference this weekend, hence the raspy voice, and the most fascinating thing was there were 1,800 people registered for this conference and only 1,000 showed up. There were literally 800 unclaimed name badges. And so, wow. yeah, it's, it's we're starting to see this trend now. And so I looked up the numbers this morning and it looks like exactly as of today, March 10th, there are 115 over, a little over 115,000 cases worldwide. There are a little over 4,000 deaths worldwide. There are 729 documented cases in the U.S. right now and 27 deaths. And so I know that there are statistics flying all around us. And I thought maybe we could take just a moment and you could give us a nice overview of what exactly it is, what is the real threat here? And I was excited enough to ask the audience for some questions. I've got tons of questions. Yay. So we'll just rapid fire through this. I'm really excited. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for having me. I just wanted to give a tiny little background. I'm a family physician by training, and I specialize in creative and functional medicine. And why that's important is because so far, according to the Centers for Disease Control, there's no available treatment for coronavirus. No treatment exists other than supportive care. But that's not true among physicians who practice integrative medicine. We have vast experience supporting the immune system and helping the body to resist whatever might come our way, including previous versions of other coronaviruses. So what's worked for those in the past, we think are likely to work for today. And we're going to, we are going to want to share with your audience many of those things. So um, to give it perspective though, I am exceedingly disappointed in our media for making the terror that is running rampant among the United States and the world. This is a very serious illness. I, I don't wanna minimize it, but so far we don't think it's any more serious than a typical influenza strain. By comparison, you gave those numbers about 115,000 worldwide cases. Compare that to regular influenza, this season alone in the United States, 34 million cases of influenza. Compare that to hospitalizations, 35,000 hospitalizations for influenza just in the United States, just this flu season. And so far about 20,000 deaths. Now a typical influenza season has between 12,000 and 65,000 deaths 
every year from influenza. That to what did you say now? 27 deaths in the United States. So by comparison, this is a very minor epidemic. Mm. Um, it's not to say it's not important. And we have a very uh, targeted population that is at risk. And that's our oldest seniors. They are significantly at greater risk. So as younger people, we are unlikely to die from this illness. There have been zero moms, listen, zero reported cases of death in children under nine. So it doesn't seem to affect young children, which we're always most afraid of as moms, right? We're always worried about our kids. You don't need to be so much for this virus, but your grandparents, they're at great risk. The uh, mortality rate is upwards of 15% for seniors above age 80. So that's what we don't wanna do. We don't wanna spread this virus around and infect our seniors. So our obligation is to protect them. And we'll talk about some universal precautions for everybody, but in particular, we wanna take care of our seniors so that our seniors are um, the most protected that they can possibly be with all of our integrative tricks of nutrition and hand, and we'll get to all those. So I wanted to give you the background of that, that it's just, nowhere near as deadly as a typical influenza so far. Well, and I think the encouraging news is, you know, when we look at the death of influenza, deaths caused by influenza, or even hospitalizations, very often, I would say probably half of that is kids, right? Because yes. they have overactive immune systems when they're young. And so we really get to lop off a huge population of concern with this virus, if I understand it correctly. You do. And um, the death rate goes up little by little by little by little as with each decade of age. So a 10 year and a couple of deaths, less than 0.1% mortality rate in the 10 year old kids. But then a little higher in the 20 year olds, a teeny bit higher. But once you get above 60, that's when it goes up and up, up and up and up. So um, 80 year olds, the worst. It's a great question. And it's a great question because it makes me wonder. So we always, when we look at statistics, is it age that is the factor? Well, that's what the studies are done on. But is it more likely that it's comorbid conditions? So people that are living with chronic illnesses or things like COPD or things like that, that re are mm -hmm. at most risk. Yes, um, and this is somewhat unusual in this virus because in the past, it's always been the people with the immune system that seem to be the riskiest ones. For this particular virus, it's people with cardiovascular disease, diabetes, high blood pressure, more so risks than lung disease. So this is unusual. I oh. might have a hint for why that might be though. And at least in, uh, this is, Seminary and um, very intriguing, and a lot of research needs to be done. But it turns out that most viruses need a docking station. They need a portal of entry, a way to get into an otherwise healthy cell to set up housekeeping and infect that cell. And this particular coronavirus, uh, and many coronaviruses, attach to the cell in what's called an ACE2 receptor, angiotensin converting enzyme type two receptor. And so these ACE inhibitors drugs are taken by patients to protect their hearts and their kidneys against the ravages of cardiovascular disease and they work tremendously well. But there is an increased expression of these receptors in lung tissue and when patients take medication, to reduce their ACE inhibitor levels, their ACE levels, I'm sorry, their angiotensin converting enzyme levels. It controls their blood pressure. It makes them less likely to suffer consequences of cardiovascular disease, but it increases the expression of these receptors on the cell membrane by fivefold for this one drug called lisinopril. We do not yet know if this is a target that we can intervene upon, and it's very, very preliminary, but let me back up and say, so, if I have a place where the virus sticks called a receptor and the medicine that I'm taking makes my body make more of these receptors, then maybe I'm at greater risk. And that might explain why patients on these medications in these risk groups are seemingly the highest risk for mortality. Another really interesting thing about ACE receptors 
that they are um, across ethnic barrier uh, borders somewhat increasingly expressed. Asian men have the highest expression of this, followed by Caucasians, followed by African Americans. So that means the Chinese seem to be at higher risk um, for serious uh, infection because of their genetic predisposition to making more ACE receptors. So again, very preliminary and yet very fascinating and something I'm gonna be keeping my eye on over the coming days. That is the first time I've heard anything explained to that extent. So, in, so just to make sure we're all clear on it, we would historically think of vi these are respiratory viruses, right? So yes. in this family. And so, however, those with compromised respiratory systems don't seem to be as at risk as those with cardiovascular issues, things like hypertension, cardiovascular disease, um, things and like diabetes, that. diabetes, yes. right? cardiometabolic. That's right. And so that's fascinating. And it's helpful because if we have friends and families that fit into this population, regardless of their age, frankly, they yes. are at greater risk, right? So we, so we think there, we, well, we know that cardiovascular disease, hypertension, and diabetes seem to be the highest risk population, regardless of age. What we don't know yet for sure is if this ACE inhibitor or ACE receptor issue is something we can mitigate, change. Do we need to, do not stop your medication. It's protecting you against a heart attack and stroke. This is a far greater risk for you if you are in those categories than the coronavirus. However, you might wanna cancel your trip where there's a high per, a percentage of this infection not to put yourself at additional harm's way, knowing what we know about this. Wow. Okay. So we'll get into, so if you heard that travel and we'll, we've got lots of questions too, to get into, but um, if you find that you or your loved ones are in this population, um, that is the most serious risk. So in those populations, you'll want to maybe curtail extensive travel or even frankly, if you live in a busy city, you might want to curtail your your day to day outdoor, you know, traveling around a city activity. Um, but we'll get into lots of questions because I know there's a ton of things there. So tell us a little bit about coronavirus. Um, I know there are many of them, but the, the one particular question that came up is, are there two strains right now that are out there and about, or is it really just one? Well, there are always coronaviruses out there. Influenza is a type of a coronavirus, so it's a general umbrella category. This particular virus that originated in Wuhan, China, is called, has many names. Um, its general category is coronavirus. Its specific name is SARS-CoV-2, and the disease that it causes is called COVID-19. So you may see it by any one of those three names. Coronavirus, SARS-CoV-2 or COVID-19. So all the same thing, different descriptions. So as far as we know, there's only one COVID-19 virus, but all viruses have a tendency to mutate. And we are seeing a decreased mortality rate across different countries compared to where it started in China. So I think people think that the virus is mutating, but it may just be that people are less susceptible to these particular infections because of something that is environmental, genetic, or racially in, um, uh, predisposed. Rel relevant, yeah, yeah predisposed. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So uh, probably the coronavirus itself will mutate. They usually do. Uh, influenza tends to mutate across different season, across the season. And also, historically, almost all influenza virus and coronavirus fades over time as the spring comes, right? Spring is generally a respite from influenza. It's a winter disease mostly. We don't exactly know why that is. Um, we have many theories. One theory, of course, being we're all cooped up inside. So we're all sharing each other's germs because in the winter time it's cold out and we stay indoors. So we tend to share germs. So the second theory as to why influenza and coronavirus generally has a seasonal variation is that mucous membranes are drier. 
in the winter time, right? We have our uh, humidity count indoors is much lower in the winter time. We all know we get that dry tongue and that dry crunchy boogers and all that. So that's because our mucous membranes are not as well hydrated and um, we are extracting that moisture into our environment. So drinking water on a regular basis is a really good strategy for reducing your risk for all viruses, not just the coronavirus. A third reason why we think that wintertime may be a worse time for viruses in general is the importance of vitamin D. We know that um, there is a seasonal variation in flu viruses. There's a very similar, almost identical variation in vitamin D blood levels. Vitamin D is made in the surface of our skin from sunlight of a certain wavelength that hits this precursor molecule in our skin called dehydrocholesterol. When that sunlight activates that, that um, molecule, it turns it into a pre um, hydroxin. It's a long and complicated process, but sunlight is required to make vitamin D. In the winter time, the sun is lower in the horizon. It isn't the right wavelength. And in almost all latitudes everywhere north of Atlanta, between October and April, you cannot make enough vitamin D to support a healthy level, which, st which studies tell us protect us against viral illnesses. So three different reasons why winter may be a worse time. And it's March, thank goodness. Coronavirus is hitting our country at a time when spring is right around the corner. So we are very likely to see a natural dissipation in infection rates as we do some of our favorite things. See the sunshine, hug a tree, get the windows open, let that spring air in, air out the sheets, Right. All of these common things that we do in springtime can reduce our risk for contracting this virus. So that is encouraging news, right? It seems like we could be turning the corner on this. Again, we don't know, but if it behaves Correct. like most viruses, especially respiratory viruses, um, the indications are good. So you did say something that, and I know let's we can start maybe even talking about uh, ways to prevent and then ways to address it. So yes. um, you did mention vitamin D, which yes. I know is a big, big, important, uh, I guess it's a vitamin, but it's really a hormone, right? It acts Correct. Like a hormone. Yes, it does. And so it's critical, right, for vitamin D levels. If you know that you're deficient in vitamin D, um, that increases your risk, I would think. Yes. Uh, for most other viruses, including influenza, there seems to be a critical number. And that number is above a blood level, above 55 to 80 nanograms per deciliter. 55 to 80 is the United States standard. And why that's important is because the lab report that you get from your doctor says a normal level is anything above 32. Well, that level normal, of third, which is low normal, low normal between 32 and 50, if you have a level in that range, you may actually be at increased risk for something called cytokine storm. And that's what happens when your white blood cells get activated by virus. They start making all of these inflammation molecules that go downstream and activate all of your cells to start flooding water. Um, it's not really water, but it's fluid, fluid um, that uh, your lungs will fill up with this fluid and you can literally drink your own fluids from cytokine storm. So the blood levels between 32 and 50 are probably the highest risk for the cytokine storm. If your blood level is below 32, your immune system's pretty weak. It doesn't make much of a response. You may actually get sick but you're not gonna have this activation of your immune system, which leads to the death. So above 55, we seem to be protected against cytokine storm. So if you're gonna take vitamin D, you wanna take enough to get your blood level up to 55. For most of my patients, that requires uh, uh, supplementation, especially in the wintertime, somewhere between 5,000 and 7,500 international units per day. Most of your over-the-counter vitamins have 400 to 1,000. So I'm taking five times the usual recommended amount. That seems to be exceedingly safe, but we do recommend that you do it with a doctor's assistance and that you have a blood level to make sure that you're getting therapeutic levels between 55 and 80. Levels above 80 may not be necessary, 
And there's one or two studies that suggest that a blood level above 80 may actually increase the risk of spreading prostate cancer in men who already have prostate cancer that spread. Mm. So we don't want to put those people at risk. So a level above 80 is probably more than you need, but um, 55 to 80 is a great target. And that's where we strive to get all of our patients all year round, Mm -hmm. not just in the flu season, but especially now with this very serious virus and especially for our seniors. Absolutely. My first thought when you talked about cytokine storm in that range of 30 to 50, uh, 32 to 50 was, oh, well, fortunately, that's not most people (laughs) because most people are below 30. Um, But either way, vitamin D is one of those things that you should have checked, I think, most frequently at your doctor. Um, Yeah, the problem is insurance doesn't like to pay for it and Medicare for it at all. And yet in our experience, it's one of the most protective life-saving vitamins that we have. You mentioned it's really a hormone because it affects not only your immune system, but your blood pressure, your blood sugar, your um, calcium and phosphorus metabolism. So it's a hugely important vitamin that has an effect on every organ and tissue in your body. And uh, it's not super expensive to check it if you have to pay cash for it because it's not covered by your insurance. Mm -hmm. And there's even some companies that will do it without a doctor's order. You can just go online and order it yourself for yourself with a finger stick. Absolutely. And we'll have a link for that as well. There there are places. So, um, okay. So I asked my audience in advance of your joining us, what questions do you have Um, specifically so that we can address them kind of once and for all, right? So one of the questions was, so, oh, wait, let's keep talking. Let's talk about washing hands because I know this is huge. (laughs) So huge. Uh, One study said they just counted people coming out of the restroom. 38% of people don't wash their hands leaving the toilet. Yuck, right? How disgusting is that? Um, And interestingly, while bathrooms and doorknobs and handles and light switches are nasty, one of the nastiest things on the planet are those gray tubs in the security line at the airport. So when we're traveling, that's probably part of the reason why traveling makes us sick. The air that's spraying on us in the airplane is filtered specifically with a micropore filter to reduce the transmission of viruses, but those tubs are not. So that probably is where we're catching a lot of our viruses from. So hand washing, the most preventive thing that you can do. Um, I was at a Georgia Academy of Family Physicians uh, conference a couple months ago, and I actually caught a cold, my first cold in a long time. And I remembered thinking that there's a lot of sick doctors here, lots of sneezing and snuffling and coughing. So I was very careful to wash my hands. So I washed my hands when I got to the conference. I washed my hands at every break. I washed my hands before I went to lunch. And then I sat down and I ate my lunch. And after I finished lunch, I went, oh no, that was a buffet line. I touched the handle of every single utensil to serve myself each individual thing. And I'll bet. And then I didn't wash my hands again after serving because I just washed them before I served myself. So I think that was probably an opportunity missed by me is after I made my plate, I should have gotten up and go wash my hands again before I sat down and put food in my mouth. So how do you wash your hands properly? And I love how you say it's 20 seconds of hand washing, running water, soap and suds, Going back to basics when we were kids, right? Yes, right. So these are some tricks. Number one, start out with the paper towel. Go to the paper towel section, get a paper towel and tuck it under your armpit. Because otherwise, you're not going to be able to turn the handle off unless it's one of those automatic ones. So um, you go to the, the sink, you turn the water on and get water on your hands first. Then put soap. I tend to get a little bit of hand eczema in the wintertime and is dry and soap before water strips the oil off of your hands. So first you're going to have less of a um, reaction to the soap. So hands in the water, soap on your hands, wash for 20 seconds. Make sure you get underneath your fingernails, in between your digits, underneath your rings, 20 seconds of washing. When the way I sing it, that's three choruses of happy birthday to me, happy birthday to me, three full choruses equals 20 seconds. 
So after 20 seconds, rinse with water. Make sure you get underneath your rings, underneath your nails, in between your digits. Rinse with water. Take that paper towel underneath your armpit. Dry your hands and use the paper towel to turn off the handle and open the bathroom door and then throw the paper towel away. Yes. So that's the number one most effective strategy that any of us have to reduce the risk of influenza, coronavirus, SARS, MERS, any anything that's traveling around the community. And it's important because coronavirus seems to be unique in that it, uh, it's transmitted by droplets. So you, call, you have coronavirus and the majority of people who have it are asymptomatic. They have no, no symptoms, but they could be contagious through mucous membrane droplets from nose and mouth. Those droplets sit on surfaces, countertops, cell phones, uh, uh, remote controls, doorknobs, light switches. Those droplets can be contagious for days at least and maybe much longer. So. Somebody was in that bathroom eight days ago with coronavirus and touched that light switch that you were so kind to turn the lights off before you left the bathroom. You just washed your hands and touched that light switch. Now you've got coronavirus on your fingers. You step out of the bathroom and rub your eyes or nose. You may contaminate yourself. So this virus is uniquely fastidious. It sticks on surfaces for a long time. But we have decontamination we call them soap. We call them <laughs> things like Lysol, Lysol and other household cleaners. But I encourage your audience to read the fine print on the label because Lysol, for example, requires 10 minutes of wet contact to completely disinfect the surface. They say it sanitizes in seconds, but it disinfects in 10 minutes. So medical oh. grade, medical grade, um, cleaners will do a better job and faster in sometimes 60 seconds. But if it's your habit to wash with one hand and wipe dry with the other, you're not giving the solution adequate contact time to disinfect the surface. And so let's talk about travel because the same thing holds true even more so in an airport, going back to those bins and the washing of your hands. When you get on the plane, now, I will tell you, I recently traveled and a colleague of mine said I was flying in. So I went to buy Clorox wipes. Everyone sold out. Yes. So cleaning off your environment around your seat is still very important. It is. And don't forget to wipe down the um, armrests, the tray table and the outlet where you're plugging in your phone to charge because these are all places other people have touched and you know everybody is always touching their cell phone so anything the cell phone touches with the cord and the plugs those are likely to also be con mm. contaminated so wipe those surfaces down um, if you can't get clorox wipes if you can't find it hand sanitizer is a poor second substitute but it's not, it's the best you have. So you can use your hand sanitizer, should have at least 60% alcohol. That's the ingredient that makes it sanitizing. And most importantly, don't touch your nose, mouth, and face. Um, so if, you, if you're in the airplane and you're stuck with nothing, just don't touch your face. And put the air on, because it's been filtered. Breathing the air of the person next to you is probably at greater risk than breathing the air that's coming down from you from the airplane. And that's fascinating. That's it. I've never heard that, but I've always been leery of the air thinking they're just piping used air on me. So it's good to know that it's cleaned. Um, I also yeah, the airlines. window seats too, because I feel like window seats are just when people are sick, they want a window. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that may be true. Um, the, the interesting, we've never been study. Uh, I take that back. I think there was a study once. I'll have to look that up and see if I can post it for your audience on which of the three seats in the airplane is the most likely to not get sick. I think there was a study about that once. My money's Don't on remember the what aisle. It said. I think the aisle <laughs> was the, the aisle. <laughs> I think the aisle was the least likely to get sick. I think you're right. So, okay, so let's shift gears and talk about ways to either boost your immunity with nutritional supplements or help uh, fight this if we find ourselves in a situation where our immune system is compromised, we're sick right. and we're kind of trying to get through it. Yeah. Well, I think 
first of all, if it's the same stuff we should be doing all the time. If coronavirus encourages people to do the fundamental wellness strategies, our country will be will have an epidemic of wellness this summer. So what are those things? Eat clean food. Don't eat junk food. It compromises your immune system. If it comes in a box or a bag from the center part of the grocery store, if it's advertised on Super Bowl Sunday, you probably shouldn't eat it, right? It's not real food. It's non-nutritive, edible food-like substances without nutrition. So get fresh, local produce from your farmer's markets, from your grocery store. Choose organic if you can afford it. Drink clean and food water, preferably not from a bottle because of all the BPA and other issues that we have with plastics. Exercise most days of the week. Exercise is a powerful anti-inflammatory. It moves your lymphatic fluid through your system. It generates endorphins. It makes you feel better. We got to get exercise. And that may be another reason why winter seasonality is worse. Many people who tend to walk and go outside and exercise in summer often don't do it in the wintertime. Mm -hmm. Spend time daily in prayer and gratitude and meditation. Um, energetically, I know this is a little bit controversy, but it's been my experience that the people who are in greatest fear attract the things that they're most afraid of, mm -hmm. not just for viruses, but for everything in life. So the more time you spend in um, happiness and gratitude and uh, meditation, the better off your immune system is going to be. We also recommend washing your nose. Uh, I use a Grosin nasal irrigator. It's like a water pick for your nose. You can do that once or twice a day. It helps wash the viruses. It takes contact time receptors in the virus in order for it to get through and into the membrane. So if you can wash it off before it's had contact time, you're going to have a less likelihood of actually getting sick from it. Avoid Does close contact. Does count there? Does yeah, a neti pot count counts there. Absolutely. Great. Neti pot Super. Mm -hmm. um, uh, this is a challenge. The CDC tells us to avoid contact with people who are sick. But I'm a physician. I'm always in contact with people who are sick. Mothers are always in contact with people who are sick. People who are sick need us. They need us most when they are sick. And so avoiding contact is a real challenge from a societal perspective and telling people uh, 14 days of isolation after they've been contact, uh, contracted coronavirus or potentially contacted it means 14 days in isolation away from your tribe. That's emotionally devastating to many people. And that devastation actually makes you more sick. So it's a real double-edged sword about how much isolation should we have versus how much care and nurturing should we provide, right? It's a challenge. I haven't solved that one yet. But um, mm. nevertheless, if there's someone you don't know who's sick, you can avoid them. <laughs> um, avoid touching your eyes, nose, and mouth, right? These are simple things. Uh, people touch their faces several hundred times a day, whether it's getting an eyelash out or wiping your nose or uh, getting your mouth your hand close to your mouth while you're brushing your teeth, right? All those things can bring that virus in closer contact. The virus doesn't get through regular skin. It gets into mucous membranes, eyes, nose, mouth. That's what we need to protect ourselves from. Mm -hmm. Oh, by the way, this is also important. We are also detecting this virus in um, swab, anal swabs in stool. So uh, there is a possibility that this virus may have a fecal oral transmission as well. So cleaning bathrooms is a really risky thing for this virus in the toilet, which it's not typically for other coronaviruses like influenza. Hmm. So um, toilet toilet hygiene is, a, is especially important. Um, cover your, no, your cough or sneeze with a tissue or with the crook of your arm if you don't have access to a tissue. And after you've sneezed in that tissue, please properly dispose of it. Don't just shove it in your pocket pocket or throw it on the floor, but let's get it in a proper waste receptacle. We talked about cleaning and disinfecting frequently touched surfaces in the household. Some of the dirtiest things are the remote control, light switches, toilet handles, doorknobs. So don't forget to get all those. Uh, car keys, don't, don't forget about car keys, especially if they're shared among household members. Um, face masks, let's talk about face masks. 
You see everybody out there wanting, you know, I was in the airport, many of the Asian people were wearing um, face masks. The CDC specifically tells us not to wear face masks. Uh, we Face masks are not to protect us from the virus. They are to protect is someone who has coronavirus from sharing it with others. So save the face mask for the sick people, the healthcare workers, the people who are uh, behind the scenes creating for us medicines and medical devices. If non-sick people hoard all of the face masks, there won't be any face masks available for those in industry and healthcare who need them to provide care. Um, we have found that um, people are using crazy devices uh, things like diapers and sanitary napkins to protect their faces, it doesn't work. Only thing that maybe these devices might do is prevent you from touching your own nose and mouth. And mittens will do that just as well as a, uh, as a face mask. So please save the face mask for other people who need it. Um, let's see, so let's talk about supplementation. I'm an integrative physician and I do believe that vitamins and um, minerals help support our immune system and help our cells, the goblet cells in our mucous membranes make better, healthier mucus. The thicker your mucus is, the more um, immune cells can uh, remain in that and keep that virus from invading into your tissue. So. There are four things that are specifically recommended right now for protecting against virus infection. Number one, vitamin C at a dose of about 3,000 milligrams a day is a good guess. How do you know if that's enough? Well, you can come to my office and get a urine test. We can dipstick your urine and see if you have high enough vitamin C. You can um, do a vitamin C flush test where you take vitamin C powder, mix it in water, drink some every few minutes um, until your bowels flush. And then that is a little bit more vitamin C that you need. And then you can calculate your daily dose. But 3000 milligrams is a general good estimate for most people. Um, split the dose up into two to three bits a day, a thousand at breakfast, a thousand at lunch, a thousand at supper. That will give you um, 3000 milligrams with the least amount of GI distress. Mm -hmm. Vitamin D we talked about, the recommendations from the Orthomolecular Medicine News Service and the International Society of Orthomolecular Medicine suggests starting with 5,000 units a day for at least two weeks and then dropping down to 2,000. Like I said, in my patient population, my patients all know what their dose is. We measure their levels and titrate accordingly. So um, the, um, the amount of vitamin D is individual. Heavier people tend to um, uh, deposit vitamin D in their fat tissue. So some of my largest patients will require 10,000 international units a day to get to target. Mm -hmm. The third mineral that seems necessary is magnesium. And this is a dose of about 400 milligrams a day. And the ones that orthomolecular recommends are citrate, malate, chelate or chloride, not magnesium oxide, which is the most common form found in nutritional supplements. Uh, and then zinc, 20 milligrams a day, and selenium, 100 micrograms a day, which you can also get by eating two Brazil nuts. So selenium, zinc, magnesium, three minerals. Isn't that interesting? Why minerals? Why are they so important for the protection against viral illnesses like influenza and coronavirus? Well, the primary reason is that number one, magnesium is used in about 400 or more um, enzyme pathways in the body. So uh, all of our detoxification and immune pathways require magnesium. Uh, does bowel elimination. So you wanna make sure you're having good bowel function. Mm -hmm. Next, zinc is uh, needed for mucous membranes. Goblet cells need zinc to make mucus. Mucus protects our uh, mucous membrane linings. Zinc is necessary to make stomach acid. Low stomach acid increases your risk for virus infection. And then um, selenium supports the thyroid, the immune system, and the production of mucus. So zinc, selenium, magnesium, vitamin D, and vitamin C. Those are great preventive strategies that we think everybody should be taking during this um, season and during the coronavirus season. 
That's great. So travel, do we cover that? So it's okay to travel. Should people be canceled? Like what, in what situations should we not travel? We know, definitely know the demographic that's the highest risk. So we know yes. they shouldn't travel. We probably shouldn't be traveling yes. to places that are increasing in cases of coronavirus. Yeah. Right. And sadly for many people, this is Europe. We're starting to get into the spring travel season and many people have their trip of a lifetime to see Paris in the spring, France, Italy, Netherlands, increasing number of cases and their um, level of uh, travel warning from the CDC is going up. So we're level two or level three countries. We probably in the interest of caution, probably should not go there. Now, what's gonna happen if you catch coronavirus? If you're under age 60, you're probably gonna get a cold or flu-like illness. If you show any symptoms at all, and maybe 80% of people will show no symptoms. They'll test positive, but they'll have no symptoms. So for the vast majority of us, it's not a serious illness. However, why do we, we not want to travel? Because it can be deadly if we bring it home and share it with people in a high risk category. And in the United States, I fear that because we have a much higher medicated population, that these, may, these meds may put our people at risk for this virus and we may see more deaths um, as the virus spreads among um, susceptible populations. So that, that's an important perspective, right? Which is from a public health perspective, we kind of, as a community member, right? We should be looking out for one another. And so right. at, if you think you're sick, that's why we want you to stay home. We don't want you to infect your community, your coworkers, even your family. Um, but more importantly, we know that there are folks at high risk that need to get out. And so we want to make sure that they stay safe. Right. So, um, yeah, so I have um, several uh, trips planned. I'm hosting a conference here in Atlanta on Saturday. We're not to, to cancel that, that. Large groups, several thousand people or more, there's some hint maybe those uh, meetings should be canceled. Medical meetings across the country, Institute of Functional Medicine canceled its spring conference, uh, sadly, uh, because of the numbers of people, thousands and thousands of people congregating. My conference is going to be small, 25 people or less. So statistically, we are at less risk. We're going to make great effort to have everybody stop and wash their hands before they sit down in the classroom. We're going to make everybody stop, leave and wash their hands at break time before anybody gets a cup of coffee or a snack. Should we have been doing this for the last 50 years, ever since we knew hand washing reduced our chances of flu? Probably. But now is a really focused opportunity for us to increase and practice these strategies because we know that they work. That's exactly right. Gosh, Dr. Campbell, I cannot thank you enough. This was such a comprehensive overview of coronavirus, What, who's at risk, what we can do about it, um, and tips for us to, to minimize the likelihood of our contracting it and spreading it more importantly, right? Yes. So yes. it's just so valuable. Can I say in the unlikely event that you do have a serious illness, if you are mild or moderate, please stay home. Mm -hmm. Call your doctor from home. Do not go to the doctor's office. Most offices, including mine, personal protective equipment that we need. We can't even get it. It's short. It's back ordered everywhere. Even if we wanted it, we couldn't get it. We cannot protect receptionists and our nursing staff and our doctors in most conventional minute clinics, family practice offices, et cetera. If you have mild or moderate illness, please stay home call in. If you just got back from a cruise ship in Italy and you weren't held in quarantine and you got off the plane and now you're feeling sick, we call your physician. They will call the public health department. And if the public health department deems it high enough risk, they will send somebody to your home to have you tested. So yourself, if you think you're high risk and call, don't see your physician. That's great. If you That's have severe point. illness. And it seems like most practitioners 
are not able to test for this right now. Correct. It's not. We, there are no right doctor's now. offices that have a coronavirus test at this time. Right. So testing is not a bit. If we wanted to, we couldn't mm -hmm. test you. Right. Even right. most public health departments in the state don't have it. They're targeted in a few areas. So mm -hmm. uh, this is why our public health people are uh, overwhelmed right now, trying to figure out where the best place is to get the test that to the people who need it the most. Right, um, right. And call, just call your doctor that they correct. are a resource. They will know. Uh, I know in Florida, they're working with the health department. So there are triage um, locations and phone numbers where your doctor is able to guide you in the right direction as to where you should go or who you should speak with. So definitely use your doctor's office as that hub, but but no reason to go in at this point. Correct. And if you have severe illness, let's say you're in a high risk category, you're over age 80 and you have a fever and a cough and muscle aches, it's probably influenza, right? We're still in flu season. But if you have reason to suspect it may be coronavirus and your friend or family member is driving you to the hospital, don't get out of the car. Mm -hmm. Keep the patient in the car send a person to the waiting room area, preferably before they even hit the front door, there will be masks available to cover the patient who is sick, don't spew mucus droplets into the waiting room. Um, you will cover their mask and then be escorted by and into a special room where they can evaluate you if you have severe illness. Now, conventional have supportive care, just like we do for every other kind of infection. This disease does seem to affect the lungs in particular, making a hazy type uh, uh, infiltrate, a pneumonia. So it's not a secondary bacterial pneumonia, which is common in influenza. It's the coronavirus cytokine storm that's making the lungs get inflamed and filled with fluid. There's no specific treatment for that. Um, supportive care, enough oxygen, breathing fluids, get the patient hydrated, do the best that we can to support their immune system. But integrative doctors have a silver bullet, ace up our sleeve, that is not well known yet. It's being studied in three clinical trials, has been approved by the government in Shanghai for the treatment of patients in China, and that's the use of IV vitamin C. Intravenous vitamin C seems to be saving people's lives. Our integrative doctors use this during the MERS and SARS epidemics. Um, those are much more serious, much have a much higher fatality rate than does coronavirus. But this treatment was very effective and it doesn't take a lot, somewhere between four and 24 grams of vitamin C a day, which is not a lot. Given IV, in some studies, they're using doses of 1.5 grams every six hours if the patient's in the hospital. The patient's outpatient, and you can get to a practitioner that will see. And right now, it's a little tentative, right? We don't have the protective equipment. Should we be seeing patients who are sick? There's this double-edged sword. I want to help, but maybe the best for me to get on personal protective equipment and set a time where a bunch of patients are going to be there all at one time that have similar illness so that we only have to garb up one. But nevertheless, in the hospital setting, if you can get vitamin C, it may save your life. Mm. Um, we know that uh, in China, many patients are seeing traditional Chinese medicine practitioners, and they have a long list of Chinese herbs that work really well. Many of them, I can't pronounce their names, but honeysuckle and Chinese skullcap for scythia, um, uh, quercetin, boswellia, which is frankincense, and especially andrographis. These herbs seem to really be supporting people's um, immune systems. And the Chinese doctors will make a decoction. It's like a tea. They'll take a little bit of this, a little bit of that, a little bit of this, according to recipes which have been proven by Chinese doctors. And this may be protective of uh, death in people who are sick with coronavirus. So to sum it up, call your doctor, whether yes. it's a, whether it's a doctor of oriental medicine, whether it's your family practitioner, call your doctor. They'll know if they offer IVs, they may be scheduling one day a week where you can come in and get vitamin C IVs or yeah. as a treatment um, if you're sick. So 
um, that's a great piece of advice that if we connect with our our local providers, they'll know best where to go. Yeah. And it's please do not just drop in to your doctor's office mm -hmm. without an appointment, especially if you have a high suspicion that you have coronavirus. They do not have the equipment to take care of you. And if you show up and expose your doctor, now they have to take themselves out of circulation for 14 days and can't see any patients. Mm -hmm. So um, from a public health perspective, that would be a nightmare if all of our doctors were suddenly sitting at home waiting for their 14 days to go away. All they could do is answer emails and talk to people by Zoom. That's not exactly our favorite way of delivering healthcare in this country. No, no, certainly not. So anything else? Any other thoughts? Um, I think that my biggest takeaway here is that this virus is to be taken seriously, but it's not very serious, right? We, unless you're in the highest risk group over age 80, coronary disease, cardiovascular illness, hypertension, diabetes. Unless you're in a high risk group, you are very likely to skate through this illness with a minimum of symptoms, a minimum of difficulty and exceedingly low mortality rate. Children below age nine, zero cases in the world so far of mortality. So little kids, not a problem. The older you get, the more risky it is. Our panic and terror over this virus is really about protecting our seniors. So let's take care of them by taking care of us, uh, washing our hands, taking our supplements, and loving and nurturing each other through a very scary time, which is likely to pass as spring comes our way. Oh, what a great summary. It's perfect. And and it just to wrap up, it's not really a question of if, it's a question of when, right? This is we're likely going to get coronavirus at some point. Uh, this is now likely to be one of many viruses in our pool of what comes around every winter. Yeah. Yes. Agreed. So what great tips, what great advice we have so many. Oh, we're, we'll write all of this up in the show notes again with evolving .com, That's where you'll find every bit of information, both about Dr. Campbell, her practice, um, any of the links to things that we discussed today, uh, any of the research, and then also all the tips that we talked about, because there are a ton of them and we enumerate them throughout uh, the show notes. So you'll be able to take a look at all of that, download it. Um, Dr. Kimball, thank you so much for your time today. There was so many unanswered questions. I know personally, so many of my friends and colleagues have been reaching out, asking me what to do. Um, and I just am so glad to be able to summarize this and bring it out to our listeners and our community. Um, thank you so much. You're welcome. It's wonderful to have you. And everyone else, follow these tips because each week we're giving you advice on ways to continue to live ageless. So coronavirus is no different. Take care of yourself. Take care of your loved ones. We'll see you back next week.